All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to episode 245 of the KISS FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill, admin on the KISS FAQ message board. I'm joined today by Weez, Daniel, Hi. and Mark's almighty Mark. So Greetings. We don't really have any structure today. What we have is unstructure. So we're just going to go to a bunch of topics on the board, a bit of this, a bit of that, and uh, we'll see where we end up. I do want to thank the guys over at the Ages of Rock podcast for having me on their show this week. You can go over and find them on YouTube and agesofrock.com for um, information about their show. I talk about the new booklet that's going to be available in Indy and a little bit more about the End of the Road Tour. On that note, I don't think there's any real KISS news this week. Uh, Paul Stanley's new book, Backstage Pass, has of course come out. In case you're wondering, I bought that. I don't get freebies from anyone. Um, And we're going to talk about a few quotes from that book uh, throughout this show. Uh, What else? Um, I think Ross Radley uh, was forced into, unfortunately, had to pop into a thread on the FAQ uh, to give a little bit of an update about magic, which continues to proceed. And I I think the, the key takeaway from that thread was that it wasn't a guarantee of a delivery date of June. Um, It was a tentative date, and, um, you know, the book will not be released before its time. So, um, you know, Ross is being diligent about providing the best possible product that he can, and he has a standard that it has to meet. Mark, I take it you won't release an album unless it meets your standards either, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I understand that aspect of it where, you want to make sure that everything is to the top notch that you can get it because people are spending their hard earned money for this stuff. You know, it's not like the amount of money that they spent on the book is like cheap or anything. You know, it's it's going to cost a bit to get the book, but it'll be well worth it. But with yeah. that said, though, there also has to be also, I think, on his part, and I kind of did this to myself, too, is that you have to give yourself, though, a deadline because if you don't give yourself a deadline you'll just let it keep going and going and going and then you'll never feel like it's completed you know i think that's the problem when you're you're producing everything yourself or or you're re- releasing stuff yourself because you're never quite satisfied there's al- always something more to add a new picture uh, a new interview that you come across so you really have to have a deadline i agree with mark there uh, we all we all experience this in in work and so on that you can always improve stuff. So I would like would like him to kind of, well, it's it's time. He's been doing this for quite some time, so he has to 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 have that deadline. I think because if people get uh, you know turned off a bit when he, he keeps on uh, uh, changing the, the the release date. Yeah, you know, I want to support Ross, you know, unconditionally. I don't have any doubts in his ability to bring his project to fruition. I I think at some point you just have to put a concrete line in the sand, so to speak, and say it will be ready. I mean, I would love an update from him um, as much as he can speak. I mean, there are probably some things that he can't tell us that we'd love to know. But... um, I think if everyone can be patient and continue to believe in magic, uh, hopefully Ross will have a full update very, very soon, which, you know, just lay out, you know, the, the final roadmap to the delivery of the, the project. It, it needs to be done. You know, people are waiting. Um, but one thing I do notice is the end of the road is not like 1996. The end of the road is not like 2000. There isn't a tremendous amount of excitement going on in the background of people clamoring for KISS product, uh, back catalog. You know, maybe it's all going through KISS's own store. So um, for those people who have paid their money, just, just know that, you know, I'm sure he's going to be able to do it, and again, hopefully we'll get an update from him soon. I certainly do recognize the difficulty of getting something exact. If anyone looks at any of the pro- the products and projects that I've been involved in, getting to the point where you say, that's it, I'm done, 
is very, very difficult. I was always waiting for one more interview, one more, uh, you know, uh, piece of information. Of and then you end up with what's beside my desk right here. Well, uh, let's just flip this open. This is my little work notebook. And um, if you can read any of that, well, <laughs> that, that's all Odyssey which is still yeah. going deluxe edition i'm working on because cool. there's a lot oh. more about the elder to be uncovered you know there's a deluxe edition that'll be done for the crazy nights book there's still interviews to be done for that nothing is ever truly done and i think this week with the publication of paul stanley's book there was let's see if i can just find them in here quickly uh, you know again copyright being what it is you're not allowed to share certain things but in terms of photos you might just see those two previously unreleased 1973 um, shots from the promo shoot session, mm -hmm. for want of a better term. I doubt it was a proper session. It was just, let's go out and take some pictures, you know. Um, and they're fantastic. I mean, people started freaking out the moment those hit the Internet. Um, but it reminds us that here we are, what is it, 47 year 46 years on since the band's formation and new shit is still coming out and, mm -hmm. I, th and I think yeah. that is a key for everyone to remember whether you're Ross working on a book whether you're someone wanting this stuff you're always getting new discoveries Daniel what were your thoughts I take it you've seen those photos and you know the the Paul Stanley driver the taxi license from the week mm -hmm. I mean do they do they blow your mind as much as I was like holy crap you know I I was like where the hell did those come from I didn't know they'd come from the book um, just blew my mind what was your reaction well I, I think it's cool I think it's cool that uh, kiss never dies sort of you, you there's always something new and because we're such nerds we 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 <laughs> we get excited by stuff like this but it's really so special to many fans. Uh, kiss and at this point of time you don't really need a lot to get excited because we have all kind of given up on new mu music and we're all uh, we have all seen that the band isn't really what they once were but uh, we're kind of uh, accepting it so stuff like this like photos and um, old videos uh, that's like the best we can get at this point but I also want to mention that Ross, I think he has a tremendous amount of uh, appreciation from the fans, even though it's like waiting for Christmas. You know, the kids love Christmas, but the wait is so hard to yeah. wait for something that you really want. So at times you can say stuff that kind of isn't nice and, and so on. But, but I do think that Ross has uh, a great support, support from KISS yeah. fans. <clears throat> And if he ever doubts that, I don't think he ha he doesn't have to to doubt that. But it's just that it's like a, this big Christmas presents that everyone wants now. So uh, I understand him. He, him he needs to take the time he, because he only gets one shot at this. If he, he releases something that's kind of subpar, I don't think it will be. Then uh, he doesn't get another shot. But uh, release this one, and then do maybe something like I think these guys. Let's see the the what was it called? Kiss Alive Forever. Mm -hmm. They released uh, an edition that you could download. I like that one because I often read from a an iPad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm much younger than you, Julian. No, I'm not. I, I, I am. I, I, I'm not it's the laughing future, at you. God. No, I cut this. I cut the spine off mine when it started falling apart because of overuse. Yeah. Mine had a lot of red ink in it and a lot of yeah. notes. So what I did was I cut the spine off it and fed it into my scanner and scanned it into a PDF. Um, okay. So I, I had a I had a digital copy on my phone long before they uh, came oh. out with their. I think that was a good idea. They, but I, they, they, their, yeah, their their iBook version looks stunning yeah. as well because they yeah. kept it very um, unlike my iBooks, which look like shit because they're text theirs was perfectly laid out and everything mark what's your thoughts on those photos uh, that have just come out oh um i i love them i mean when i first saw them too i was very surprised to see something like that but on one hand i wasn't really surprised like don't get me wrong i, I loved seeing them and they're a moment in time that you know we we get to see again you know and the the thing that i always find interesting is that 
people react so strongly to them. But in the back of everybody's mind, I think, or at least a lot of people's mind, I think that we all kind of suspect that this stuff is there somewhere. You know what I mean? Like whenever we talk about stuff in the vaults and stuff like that, I'm convinced that there's stuff that KISS have that is yet to be shown to us that they're maybe waiting for a specific time or a specific sort of project to show us. Because, you know, this is a band with a vast history. They had really good management back in the time and they had all kinds of things that they did, television, radio, blah, 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 blah. And there's like so much stuff that they were involved with that, of course, there's stuff in their vaults that we haven't seen yet, you know. And with the passage of time, some of it's maybe been forgotten. Some of it's maybe been put somewhere where they forgot about. And, you know, all of a sudden they go into their warehouse and stumble across some shelf that they didn't look at for a long time. And wow, look what I just found. So that's the, that's the kind of stuff that I think there's going to be a lot more of in the future. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it once the tour even wraps up. Because once the tour is done, that they have lots of more time for this sort of anomalies and stuff like that to pick out of the shelf to, to show people. I also think they uh, they can start releasing stuff from the 80s and 90s a bit more because they, uh, if they have something from the revenge store uh, like uh, clothes or or uh, uh, you know his sword thing that he uses when he blow blow <laughs> blows fire and um, even um, ticket stubs uh, I mean there has to be a lot of stuff from those tours, like the Revenge Tour and, and the Hot in the Shade Tour, that's really not that old, but is starting to uh, get a lot of... Becoming uh, historic. Yeah, historic, you know, classic, sort of. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it 10 years ago, you wouldn't think of it as classic, maybe, but now it starts to become that. So mm -hmm. I would like them to open up the Revenge Vault and see what they have. I think you can find a lot of stuff from that era, because we really haven't seen a lot from that era. Uh, yeah. This hasn't released a lot from that era, so I think you have at least one or two really interesting st things fr from that era that, that they that, that are sitting on some shelf somewhere. Yeah, I mean, even the even the 80s in general, I mean, there yeah. must be some stuff from Lick It Up era and, you know, the animalized stuff. There's There's got to be stuff, and I think that, for example, would be something that people would be interested in because there's so little of Mark St. John. Anything with him involved in it is going to be gold in the future. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Additional photos of him performing live have just been posted online mm -hmm. as well in the last month. Um, so again, everything new is possible, as are yes. new rediscoveries. I mean, I just posted an interview yesterday on... Um, on our YouTube, and that's uh, what was it? It was uh, 94 HJY from June 1991. So Eric Carr in the rehearsal studio um, with Bruce, Gene, and Paul uh, being interviewed by Lou Brutus from Providence Radio. It's only 13 minutes long, and you know this it will be a rediscovery for some people who've never heard it before. Other people who will have had it on, a copy on tape for many years will be, yeah, I, I remember that. Oh, I don't remember that part of it. Um, you know, and others will be, well, meh, you know, I've heard it before. But I think the point is whether it's you know personal or Paul Stanley going into his archive. You know, it seems in this case for Paul's book that Paul has some stuff that Gene doesn't. And it seems Gene's been left with all the Spencer's crap, and Paul Stanley ha <laughs> and Paul has the '73 promo shots, you know. So um, I, I think that's probably been a safer thing. That I think Paul did explain that you know these were in his personal storage, not in the Kiss warehouse. So I mean, he had a wicked Lester reel, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So. You know, there's totally hope for new stuff, and I mean this radio interview as well. Um, you know, we were talking about revenge a moment ago. Well, this is a work, you know, they're talking about why they're recording their work sessions in the studio with Eric Carr. And I'm like, who's got those tapes? I, mm. I, I mean, they were recording them with Bob, um, you know, to go back and immediately review what, what minor or major arrangement changes they were doing as they were going, you know, and Paul explains it on the tape. So you can go on YouTube uh, to the Kiss Have a Q channel and check it out uh, for yourself. But he says, you know, you know, we're too busy playing and sometimes playing something complicated to be able to be critical at the same time. So we record all this stuff uh, so that we can sit back and listen to it after the fact. And Gene's like, it's pretty primitive, but, you know, it, it's to hear, 
to hear the genesis of the development of the songs, which is just the shit I love. I mean, mm-hmm. go back to those elder tapes that I've been posting stuff off recently in the song of the moment that you hear, you know, it's my life, which is basically the riff just a, a long piece and you know where it becomes i i've always been fascinated by the creation of music so you know that's that's the stuff i really hope and we know there's going to be more last year Tor- I, I, toronto i just think there's a problem because kiss at times they don't understand the goal they're sitting on you know <laughs> they release something that we really don't care about you know re-releases or or uh, uh greatest hit, greatest hits packages packages when they really could just dig out a few things from the vault and people would go nuts over them, you know? And Bruce often talk about um, stuff that he has from the recordings, and uh, uh, I would also love to see those. Uh, so Bruce, if he could get together with Paul and Jean and, uh, you know, uh, bring his stuff, and then maybe they could do some Revenge Edition Deluxe something. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I I strongly feel that Revenge is probably the most likely candidate for a, you know, a deluxe edition. It would just be, it, I think it would make the most sense in some ways, you know, because it's got all the the elements there. Um, again, just going back to that radio thing quickly, they do know what pot of gold they're sitting on because Gene in this interview segment talks uh, about them re- releasing what was it, a uh, first kiss, last le- last licks, licks, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, in the middle of Hot in the Shade because, and and he explains it, because that 1973 demo had started circulating in the couple of years prior to that, that it was their way of kind of going up against the bootleggers. That's how he explains it. But two of those songs obviously ended up on uh, CD singles and, you know, 12-inch singles all over the world at that time. So they're very cognizant of the fact that, you know, there's money to be made. And that full demo has never been released. You know, you've got the same two songs on the box set. Um so now you've got additional photos from the 73 era. It's like, uh, I just, if I had any hair left, I'd be pulling it out, uh, <laughs> knowing that someone did pitch to them a great 1973 deluxe edition, which would have had the daisy in it, would have had the demo in it, would have had the rehearsals mm-hmm. in it before it all leaked for free. But I still say that they can go back and do it properly because we will pay for quality. You know, yeah. uh, a reasonable amount, not two thousand dollars, please. Um, you know, but I, I think everyone would be willing to pay for, even if we already own the, you know, the Coventry DVD. If everything from nineteen seventy three, including the latest remaster of the album, was packaged up into one nice box, you know, look at mm-hmm. how Metallica has done their Kill 'Em All and Master of Puppets monster boxes. How Def Leppard's doing their gigantic ones. How King Crimson have done their reissues. Um, yeah, I threw that there for you. I have no idea of any of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, then it, it's all very doable, and I think that's what makes me so sad from seeing these new photos, or when I saw the the Wicked Lester reel, that there is stuff, and I'm impatient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, there you go. Um, I do want to give Andrew, little Andrew, a shout out because I'm, of course, today wearing. Get my boobs out of the way. Um, the great, the great, <laughs> the greatest show on earth T-shirt did arrive from Click T. Thank you to them for the great service, great packaging. Um, if you're interested in a T-shirt from his incredible, yeah, I'm. You know, people probably say shut up about it already. Well, I thought it was really good, so uh, now you can wear a T-shirt with that very cool logo on it. So. Nicely, yeah. nicely done, Andrew. I, I, I know that you did get a few supporters out of that. All right, so let's jump into a few um, quotes from Paul's book. Um, it set off a lot of multi-page threads on the FAQ. Understandably, the first one that came out was, um, to be honest, pretty unfortunate. I can't remember if we taped the other show last week uh, when we were talking about Paul's interview, uh, the 29th. Yeah, no, this came out Monday. Of this week, and it was Paul Stanley attacking Peter Chris again, which I, I I just shook my head. I'm like, why do you need to go there? Peter Chris must be really under Paul Stanley's skin for him 
in his self-help book about letting go and coming to grips um, <laughs> and, and everything, coming out and saying, I'm, I don't want to read this whole quote because I, I frankly find some of it very offensive. Um, but he says, Peter, unfortunately, is a different story. I don't think Peter has any life. Um, yeah. He's always been negative and always maintained an us against them mentality. I don't want that in my life. Well, that's what exactly what Kiss was founded on, uh, them against the world yeah. in doing something completely different. And uh, let me just turn it over to you guys because I'm getting all – my gears are grinding, you know, just thinking. Uh, agitated? I, I am agitated because Peter Chris is basically retired and off the radar. When's the last yeah. time Peter actually, you know, did something on his website other than wishing someone a happy birthday, celebrating a fan – all very positive things in recent years. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to go back and defend Peter for his history in the band because I wasn't there. We know that there were challenges. Peter's never, you know, shied away from talking about that kind of stuff. But everything, his battle with breast cancer, his work with charities, has been very, very positive, and he doesn't yeah. get involved in the politics and bullshit. And then just when he thought he was out, Paul Stanley drags him back in with this yeah. Yeah, negative crap, which I don't think serves Paul well either. Paul, no. if he has conquered the mountain, lived to win, uh, oh, throw in any of them that you want, should be <laughs> should be above and past that, while, uh, while yeah. being able to acknowledge that he had challenges. So... Want to be, you know. I think. Yeah. Go go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, I think he he has a big problem with he's holding grudges forever. Uh, not only with with Peter Chris, but but like interviewers that asks uh, the, the the wrong questions. I mean, uh, look at Eddie Trunk for example. Uh, he doesn't even speak to that guy, and he's been one of his biggest fans uh, through the years. Uh, and also enough is enough. I mean, how many times can you say the same stuff over and over again? And uh, the stuff he's criticizing, how long How, how long is it since he was in the band, Peter Chris? I think it was 2003, maybe, or something. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of years ago. So, and it's unfortunate because he really comes across as this grumpy old man. And he's nothing like I experienced that he was in the mid 80s, but I guess he was hiding it because it seems like he's always been kind of a you know sensitive guy who holds grudges, and it's uh, really not uh, very tiltilating or whatever you say. I mean, I I, uh, I have a hard time accepting him criticizing Peter Chris, especially as you said, Peter Chris has been really um, mellow the 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 last. 15 years maybe off the, and radar. off the radar and and when you see him it's been in a positive way uh, you just have to look at you know the concert he did, did with ace when they celebrated i think it was a uh, Eddie trunks 50 years in radio or something 40 years in radio or something like that and also the concerts he did um you know those farewell concerts all smiles, very kind with the fans from what I've seen and read. So, I mean, it's like beating a dead horse. I mean, and he's such a megalomaniac, Paul Stanley, that, you know, and the stuff he releases. I mean, look at his Twitter account, you know, all the pizzas and spaghetti. I mean, and he's terrible at, um, you know, maintaining this uh, aura that we've had about him all the time, you know, like the rock guy. He's like my fucking grandfather or something. I mean, really boring, very negative, and holding grudges. So, so I have a hard time reading that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I will even read that book. Uh, it seems like, well, if, if there isn't a lot of new things. Yeah, well, I mean, just to put my two cents in on the Peter Chris thing, um, I, I find it also disrespectful hear him to do that to him like we said he's been off the radar for such a long time and i think to me though that part of it proves to me that he 
is having a, a is having a life and a decent life at that because he's probably enjoying his time with his with his girlfriend slash wife and you know he's he's enjoying you know his retirement because he's not getting involved in all these little peddly disputes that to me kind of shows to me that he doesn't give a crap about what Paul Stanley says he's just going to enjoy his life now go enjoy his time with what he's doing now you know i heard if i'm not mistaken that he, he does have an appearance coming up somewhere for something but you know he just goes and does things on his own whenever he wants to go and do it and you know he's to me it seems like he's really enjoying this time of his life and doesn't want to get involved with all this kind of nonsense and to me you know i always used to think and we were always taught as you know as you grow up that as you get older you let things go and let bygones be bygones you know even in my family my my side of my like my father's side of the family are terrible for holding grudges but even them would end up you know having a big tearful hug reunion in their late 60s or 70s finally you know giving up the big you know dispute that they had you know and it just seems like paul is having trouble you know just getting over things and moving on with his life i mean what does he have to be grouchy about this guy has got a successful career has a fantastic family, has a great home. You know, he's enjoying a, another resurgence in his career. All the shows are doing fantastic on the tour now. So what does he have to be bitter about? And the the, the idea of him doing a self-help book when you're not even helped yourself just seems ridiculous to me. And it's one of the reasons why I'm very reluctant to buy it. And I'm a guy who buys all these books. I love these kind of books. I bought all the band members books that that have come out but this one I'm really hesitant on because it just seems like it's nothing but sour grapes and why am I going to get advice from him when he does and when it doesn't even seem like he's been cured. Yeah, I I don't think there is any cure when it comes to Peter Chris. I think he is so embedded in Paul's DNA at this point that there must be something very serious underlying um, that it still comes out or manifests itself in this way because I, I think my comment on the FAQ was you know this coming from a guy who lives in a glass house you know criticizing Peter like that it's it's like no matter how many times you tell the lie it's not going to become truth but it's mm -hmm. almost like he wants to denigrate Peter's position in the band to the point where people believe that Peter doesn't count, yet it is, and he says it himself, you know, that it, it is all four members of the band that made the band what it was, and that's the part that is magical about KISS. No matter what the failings, personal, chemical, or otherwise, of Ace and Peter are, they are critical. That backbeat of Peter, no matter what you talk about his skill as a technician, and again, going back to that 1991 interview we just posted, or I just posted, you know, I, I, I think it was that one. Might be. Enough. I've been going through so many interviews. Um, Eric talks about wanting to do drum clinics, but not feeling that he had the technical skill in order to go in front of a small audience and tell them, you know, how to become a better drummer that he was perfectly comfortable playing in front of thousands. I think Peter's the kind of the same, the essence in that while he may not be a technical drummer who can explain what he's doing or how he's doing or name what the percussive elements are that are part of his repertoire, that the feel and heart and passion behind those are a critical component into making the sound that was Kiss, especially live. Go listen to the Daisy Tape, listen to the Coventry mm. performance, listen to anything from 1974. Um, that is Kiss. And Paul can't take that away, no matter what Paul does. So it, it's like futile, Paul. It, it's like, let it go. Uh, I, I think it, if he's going to help himself, he's got to let go of this baggage of Peter Chris being under his skin. Because, number one, Peter's not responding to the bait. Yeah. You know, leave. It, it's like, leave Peter alone. Yeah, if Peter did something to you personally in your in your life that's perfectly fine that's none of the fans business we don't care um that's between you guys you guys weren't family you never were you were just four misfits who came together to make the the perfect element you had luck so you know it, it's just unfortunate that that was one of the key bits of press to kind of come out and i, I almost regret not requesting an advanced copy of this book you know knowing that that was the sort of thing in here. But let's start on the very first page of this book, and I just want to read you the first line. 
of the book because this is another one that's generated a bunch of commentary on the FAQ message board and elsewhere. I feel like Paul Stanley, uh, that thing he did the other day, uh, he, did a, <laughs> he did a little reading, except he had lights on his glasses. Um, there was a time when I wished my father would die. Before my mom passed away, my dad was not a nice person. He was really difficult to be around and very angry, so I hoped he wouldn't be around, and that his death would be a quick solution to the ugliness that was happening between my parents and tainting so much around him. That is fucking brutal. Um, it's also a great artistic device that shock and awe is a great way to open up anything <laughs> and get attention, but... Um, and context is everything. I mean, people have gone off uh, the rails getting angry with Paul about even uttering those words. Um, but Paul goes on to explain that he could not then have built the relationship that he has with his father at 99 years old and appreciate his father being there and going back and appreciating some of the experiences that he did have with his father without being to the point where he really wanted his father gone. So the context is much greater than the the horrid <laughs> first sentence actually is, because Paul goes back and explains it all. You know, what are your thoughts on him even using that device or the sentiment behind it? Well, I understand why he did it, just as you said, to create a buzz, but uh, uh, I'm sure it was the way, right way to start the book off. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure all of us have felt at least similar feelings when when parents have been uh, you know not so supportive or if they have uh, disappointed us a lot it's a natural feeling and i think that might be what he wants to get across you know i'm just like you and and you feel like you've been let down and you want to maybe hurt or or, or hurt people around you or get back at people it's just a natural feeling. I don't see it as something spectacular or very strange. I think it's just part of being a human being that uh, you get the most upset with the people you care the most about. I mean, some of my best friends are the ones I've been into the biggest arguments with, you know. And people I don't care about, I really don't give much thought. Uh, and so, so I think it's a natural thing to feel at times. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be honest. I've I've had some rough patches with my own father before he passed away as well. Um, luckily, before he did, I did resolve a lot of stuff with my father, which is good. And I'm, you know, so I can understand that aspect of it as well. But I mean, maybe this is just me. I'm not sure how others feel about it, but I'm sure I'll hear on the comments section. But um, I think that, for example, this kind of a thing to me seems very personal. Now, I understand that he used this as a, you know, like you said, a shock and awe for his book, maybe to get some attention going. But for me, I've always was was taught or grew up to believe that family stuff you keep within family. You don't air your dirty laundry out like that to other people. You know, I I've, I've never would have went on into my, you know, my own like a web thing that I do or my own YouTube channel and ever go and you know, talk about a family member in that sort of manner, saying that I hope that he would die or this and that. I mean, I, like I said, I understand where it comes from. And I'm sure everybody, when they were a teenager or had some point in their life where they had complications with family members. But to me, that's something you keep behind closed doors with your family. That's something that you need to resolve within your own family. It's not something that the whole world needs to know about. So that's kind of the thing that kind of gives gave it a bit of a bad taste in my mouth when I heard about it, because it just seems like it's been used for extra publicity or for extra attention, you know, and that's kind of a shitty thing to do, I think. Yeah, no. yeah but I, I also think that, I haven't read the book, but it's a way of making people, because we all think of KISS as this big group who wants to earn money, so of course immediately, immediately you think that he's doing this to create a buzz and get us our attention. He might turn it around later in the book, you know. Uh, he might discuss it in a way that makes it a good thing, you know, that you can, uh, you know, put a patch on old... Work things out. Yeah, work things out, you know. So, so I'm, I have to read the book before I can, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, and, and that's one thing I do want to make critically clear to everyone listening to this, that uh, I'm throwing some quotes at these guys to talk about, and they have not read the book. And if you haven't read the book out there as well, it's important that you do read the book to get the full context, because there's a lot of supporting material around these quotes. Um, and I'm just cherry picking a few. Um, I'm trying to say that, yes, there was a context that followed on. I'm trying to be mm -hmm. fair to Paul and not mislead anyone listening to this. But please don't just take the quote at face value. Make sure if before you get all mad and pissed off at Paul or me that you've read the book and <laughs> understand the context in which he's writing. Because this is yeah. Paul Stanley. When you listen to him speak, he has fully formed thoughts that he expresses very eloquently. And it's the same in the book. They, they are a device that's set up or... Or, or important part of him making a point and again in discussing them as we are we're just looking at one facet of them not the mm -hmm. the full essence so don't be unfair to paul um and I, i'm not trying to draw you know or you know get any drama going they were just ones that jumped out at me during my first yeah. quick scan of the book and to be perfectly honest i have not yet read the whole thing i haven't taken any notes on it um but, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll write a review in text when I get a chance. So, all right, let's move on to the next one. Um, okay, if we go with the status quo, we tend to live in mediocrity. I was never cut out for that. I always knew I couldn't work nine to five. It was unthinkable. I would have slipped my wrists. Hard work and routine are fine, but that hard work and routine had to be exciting to me. Something I had to have a passion for. <laughs> okay well i'm a nine to five guy so um daniel I, you're a nine to five guy as well i mean uh what do you think on that comment uh, i think it's easy to make that comment when when you've made it but uh we all mo at least most of us just has we have to be nine to five guys and, and do the exciting stuff on the side uh, so i think he would have been able to do a nine to five job if it didn't make it. I mean, he has the, he's a hard worker. Uh, he is driven and he could have used that in other lines of work. So, uh, well, I just think it's a way of, uh, because a lot of these rock guys, they, they say similar stuff. Uh, I knew I would make it. I, I, I was <laughs> destined for this. I mean, Ace Frehley is one of them. I knew I would, but I'm, some of it is luck and being a at lot the of right. Yeah, because you have a lot of bands that could play their instruments way better than Kiss, uh, could sing better than Ace or Peter, and you had they had better drummers, but they didn't make it. So there's a lot that go into being successful, and Kiss had a lot of help uh, that they had. Bill O'Coin and uh, Casablanca and really early on. So they had a lot of help. So I wouldn't say he did it by himself and that he was destined for it. He had a lot of help. Uh, and that's something that he really, he didn't, he, he don't give a lot of credit to the people around him that helped him. I think he's, he's kind of showing a time ignorance. Time. Yeah, but ignorance for it, but, but, but also he, he feels like a megalomaniac. I mean, he, he just sees himself as the main guy in every situation. And uh, I don't know, if Gene hadn't been in that band in the beginning with all the blood spitting and demonic um, look, no, I don't know what he says about Gene in the book, but no way they would have made it. It was, well, the, it was, it was the combination of bad and, and good and evil and yeah. No. Well, I want, to, I want to just jump in on one thing, though, with that that you mentioned, Daniel, when you said that he has other people helping him and about Gene. I think Gene early on played a pivotal role that, yeah. like like he said, I haven't read the book, too, so I don't know if he mentions this. But to me, when I hear that, uh, I get upset because I think to myself, OK, what about Gene and all the times that he sent out those hundreds of you know invitations to all these industry people? He would go through all these books and try to invite people. If it wasn't him doing that behind the scene, there would be no a coin that came to watch them play the show, and there'd be no a coin to come and manage them and get them to the point that they did. So you know what I mean? It almost seems like he's saying, "Well, 
I would have got there anyways without any of this stuff happening. And I think that's bullshit because Gene had had a lot to do with the fact that they had people looking at them when they did. Because if he wouldn't have done that, they would have been just another band in a bar playing and people would have just, you know, just looked at them as just like another band. You know, if it wasn't for people like a coin and Sean Delaney and Casablanca, this band wouldn't have gotten nowhere near as far as they did, you know? It's it's just absolutely ridiculous. And the other thing that really bothers me, as being an independent artist myself, I take great um, care with how I talk about people that support me because the, I don't know what some of these people's situations, you know, and I think, and I'm sure that a lot of people are nine to five people too. And I respect that because for very, very, very long time, I worked a nine to five job myself as well. And I know how hard it could be and, you know, and how difficult sometimes it could be to get up in the morning and go to do your work when you don't want to go and do it, you know, but you have to do it to put money on the table, to feed the family, to pay the mortgage. And that's all stuff that has to be done. And to kind of downplay that, like, oh, I don't want to do a nine to five thing. I'd rather slit my wrist. Well, you know what? That's sort of stupid to say, because I think sometimes people, when they wake up in the morning, that thought may cross their mind that they'd rather do that than go to work, you know, but they have to do it. And the greater importance of family and other things make them go and do it. So I would never, ever dare say that to anybody who supports me and my music and stuff like that. And I think that he really needs to step back and think about that. Yeah, I think you just, um, you're on the same wavelength with me on that. Um, as someone who has sold product to fans, I'm cognizant of the value of a dollar, mm -hmm. you know, handed over from someone. But I also think that, that it jumped out at me because I've always felt that the Kiss Army's demographic, generally speaking, is broadly blue collar, working class, hardworking, um, passionate. And to have said, if I had to do what you guys do, I'd kill myself. Just kind of rub me a little bit the wrong way. I, I don't. I'm not offended by it. I'm just like, you know, some thoughts are better left in here and not mm. out there. Yeah, I'm, and I'm guilty of making com flippant comments in, in the past, uh, of course, and we all are. Um, I, I I know he, what he's trying to explain that the humdrum. Um, also, and you know, going to something that you said, Mark, about Paul being successful out, outside, you know, he would have found success. I think he's very careful to to kind of not take the success of Kiss on his own shoulders. It, you know, Alcoin and Delaney's importance are mentioned in the book, or at least the, again through okay. my quick scan, he doesn't claim to take credit for that. One thing he does kind of say is that if you are if you are hard working that you will be successful well then why isn't anvil a you know a major yeah. international rich act you know why is lips delivering you know packaged meals it doesn't work that way paul it's very easy to look down on the ivory tower from your ivory tower and say well i worked hard to get to here and you can too rich people do that all the time and it's a big fucking mistake for them to be so arrogant to tell us little people that if we just work a little bit harder we'd be as rich and successful as they are no luck as you said is the key they got lucky with all coin they got lucky with sean delaney mm -hmm. <laughs> because that show didn't exist they got lucky with bogart and casablanca they got lucky with glickman marks and the cleveland individuals um so mm -hmm. luck is more important than hard work but the two are symbiotic that you have to work hard but you have to have a great deal of luck i mean you, ha you have to have a work ethic and i think that's more the point that he tries to make that his and gene's work ethic was superior to aces and peter but you know what Ace and Peter are as legendary as Gene and Paul when it comes to talking about Kiss. So if Lace didn't, if Lace, if Ace didn't want to carry his own fucking amps, well, he still got there as well. And they split those. Uh, they originally split it all equally, didn't they? So mm -hmm. you know that that is a little bit of a misnomer that I do find find hilarious. But I stop. think I think yeah, I think a problem for Paul is that he 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 gets yes yes men around him. He's very mm. sensitive, yeah. so everyone who, who talks back to him, he ignores that guy and never talks to him again. And do that for a, uh, a decade or two, 
then you're surrounded by jazz guys. And I remember watching an interview with Joe Rogan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. Yes. Uh, an MMA, MMA guy. And he actually, when Paul went into one of his rants about uh, how um, piracy was killing music and all of that, he actually stood up to Paul a little bit. And he was perplexed, you know, Paul Stanley. He was shocked and he, mm -hmm. uh, he almost didn't know what to say uh, because he was not used to that. He's like, he's been surrounded by jazz guys for decades. So, and that's why a guy like Eddie Trunk uh, that I mentioned earlier never gets an interview with, with, with Paul. And that's why a guy like that uh, wrestler, was it Chris, what's the name of that Jericho. wrestler? Jericho. Oh, Jericho. Yeah, Jericho. Jericho. Who, who's he's mentioned in the book. Of course, he's like a friend asking softball questions and getting oh, yeah. a lot of interviews. And people see that, and then uh, great interviewers like Mitch LaFong suddenly becomes a jazz guy when he interviews Paul Stanley. So it's like an epi epi ep 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 epidemic. Ep ep yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so um, yeah. No, oh, good, th good thoughts there. All right, let's 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 move on to another quote, because this one kind of ties in with what I was just talking about. I suppose everybody wants to be famous, but what are we doing to reach that goal? Don't kid yourself. The bands that have done the best didn't fall into their success, and they certainly didn't sustain it by accident. Nobody who's around for decades stays there by chance. It's work. It's thinking things through, and regardless of what they say, it's a hunger and thirst to stay successful. If you don't have that from the start, you won't achieve success, and you certainly won't sustain it. <laughs> that that just goes back to what I've kind of been saying. Uh, again, luck, I, I think, is much more important than hard work, as Kiss well know. Because in the 1980s, if success was measured by hard work, they would have been much more successful than they were. Look at, I'll take mm -hmm. as a prime example, Creatures of the Night. All the passion, all the fucking energy, all the mm -hmm. we're not going to take it attitude, and all the dedication to the recording of that wonderful album, incredible album, landmark album, um, meant nothing. It didn't go gold until 1990-whatever, 94 for that one. Lick 94, it, yeah. Yeah, Lick It Up, another incredible album, fantastically crafted, constructed, again, incredible went gold didn't go platinum until 1990 for that one so i i think luck again is what it's about a, a, a band like aerosmith let's talk about a band with longevity they were lucky mm. they you know certainly were yeah. working very hard in 1985 when uh, they did oh. done with mirrors uh, yeah that was just no. a, that was just a haphazard kind uh, of sloppy old school Aerosmith yeah, but album. have a look. Have a look at the dirt, for example. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, I mean, the guys are lunatics, uh, drinking and doing coke, and uh, and killing well, drummers. Yeah, <laughs> killing drummers, all kind of stuff, and they became like the biggest band by the late '80s. So uh, there's a lot of. So they were lucky. Into. Yeah, well, but, yeah. But, they were lazy, but, but lavicious, uh, lascivious, and lucky. But you know what, though? A, a lot of thing that, things that people forget about is the people behind the scenes, like Doc McGee, for example, yeah. For example, yeah. with Motley Crue. If you didn't have him, Motley Crue would have yeah. fell on their rear ends and went nowhere, you know, especially around theater of pain and, you know, girls, girls, girls and stuff like that. Because what people seem to forget is these people, like the managers and the merchandising companies and all these other things that support the band, they're making money off of these people. So... You know, it's not that they worked so hard. There's lots of people working hard for them because if they don't help and work hard for them to help them get to a certain point, their money machine will slow down as well. So they need to have them doing well so that they can do well as well. I mean, that's, this is a big circle. You know what I mean? It, that's why you hear stories like Doc McGee getting pissed off and you know telling Nicky Six that he's an idiot and to get his act together, and he was helping him get off the heroin by dragging him, literally picking him up and throwing him into his hot tub to get over his aches and pains from the withdrawal and stuff like that. Like people would only go to that point 
I think, A, if you're really good friends with the person, or B, they're making a lot of money off of this guy and he won't be making it much longer if he if this guy dies. You know what I mean? So I think that's a one point that people seem to forget about. It's not just these guys are such a great band and that's why they made it. Lots of other people made that happen. Indeed. That's that, that's very, very true. You know, keep keep your talent happy. All right. That's, uh, okay, we're up to page 102 here. So this one, oh, Peter Chris comes back into the picture. <laughs> At times in the only days, there was resentment about who was at the front of the stage or who had the most songs on an album. And rather than deal with that, we tried to undermine or outvote each other. Peter, for instance, used to throw drumsticks at me when we were on stage. Ah, now we get to the root of why he hates Peter so much. Uh, <laughs> if he could have, he would have rigged the stage with landmines. He had a sort of exclusionary zone in front of the drum riser. And if I drifted into it during a show, he pelted me with sticks instead of dealing with whatever frustration he had in his life. Oh, Paul, I think he was dealing with the frustration that he had in his life by throwing sticks at it. Um, <laughs> what do you got to take from that? Again, it's a big exaggeration, I think. How many times do you think Peter Chris actually threw a, a stick at Paul? Once, twice. I mean, he, he's... So full of it, um, I don't know even what to say. <laughs> yeah, Paul, Paul yeah. calls that like pass. Uh, later on in that that paragraph, he says whatever it was, uh, passive aggression is just a misplaced anger. Sorry, throwing sticks at your head is not passive aggressive. That's a very <laughs> active aggressive, Mark. Yeah, no kidding. But yeah, yeah, I mean, everyone who has been playing in bands know that this kind of stuff happens. You just have to deal with it and talk about it. I mean, if you live close. Uh, with each other for a long amount of time, of course you're going to argue, and of course you're going to get in in, your, in in each other's face at times. I mean, it's perfectly normal. I'm yeah. sure Paul Stanley did a lot towards Peter Chris at the time, but it, maybe he fails to mention that in the book. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I understand where the frustration comes from because, like you said, you're in the same area with with these people for a long time i mean i mean the band that i was in before that reckoned with one band we all bought a house together and lived in the same house together we wrote together you know we had dinner together we did everything together we were literally a family at that time and you know and families sometimes get on each other's skin under each other's skin and you know you have little blowouts like that but you know the the, the thing is it's just how you how you resolve it you know and maybe at that time Maybe Paul and Peter were not the, you know, didn't know how to resolve their differences verbally. So maybe every once in a while something like that would happen. You know, I've never had something like that happen in my band, but we've had enough times where there was issues happening. And we, one thing that we always tried to make sure of, and we said to each other, is that we would never try to go on stage with the issue happening. We would try to resolve it beforehand, before we went on, or afterwards, and just try to get it resolved. And you know, it. it that I think works a lot better, but you know, look, Kiss were a very busy band. They were going from here to here. They were constantly moving around. You know, maybe they didn't have enough time to work at some of these differences. Who knows? But you know, th it happens, and he makes it sound like such a, you know, such a big, disastrous event that Peter Chris threw a stick at me. Like, come on, man! I've seen worse things. Now there was a top ten. On on YouTube just now, like the top ten blowouts on stage with a with band members, you know. And I've seen far worse. I've seen guys on stage tackling each other and beating the shit out of each other on stage. So you should be lucky only a drumstick through was, was thrown your way. Like, come on. Yeah, I, I I'm very curious to hear. Um, and it's one thing I don't think we've ever heard of is how did the band members deal with these interpersonal relationships during the early days? You're, you know, traveling city to city in a station wagon, I, I think they recall. They must have had friction. Did they ever talk about that? I mean, I don't want to, to end up like a therapy session, but the, did they ever, as you just said, Mark, you know, don't go on stage with issues unresolved. Did they ever talk about how to deal with these sorts of problems that four guys from very different backgrounds Grounds, you know, got into. I, I would have thought that the the two Jewish guys in this equation that came from a kind of more conservative traditional background versus the two um, that had experience with knives and zip guns might have thought about discussing how to deal with some of this shit um, b 
before it reached a boiling point. I mean, I, certainly if I'm dealing with someone who I know has weapons experience, it changes the way I interact with them, shall we say. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's, you know, Paul wasn't that young in 1974. He's 23 years old, uh, 22, 23, yeah, 22. Um, and I can only project as to what I was like at that age. And I'd been out on my own pretty much since I was 16. So um, kind of kind of difficult, even if he had an unhappy background about how it seems that they had an, they were completely dysfunctional from day one and never, ever got to grips with dealing with one another on any sort of level while they all strove to become famous. So... <laughs> That's rather sad when you think about it. Let's go on to another. another. And this is one. This is a positive one. Okay. Let's just make it clear. I'm, All right. I'm throwing in a positive one. Um, I kicked the bucket list. We often make a fundamental mistake when talking about a bucket list. A bucket list should always be expanding based on our experience, not getting shorter. If we're slowly checking off items on our list without adding new items, we're doing it wrong. You could say, I only have one item on my bucket list. Never reach the end of my bucket list. I love that because I've always liked this one kind of uh, saying of may all your dreams come true except one. Because if you have nothing left to dream for, you have mm -hmm. no, no reason yeah. to live. There's a nice little Paul reference as well. Um, Daniel, what are your thoughts on bucket lists? Uh, well, I certainly think it's important to have goals in your life. Um, you always have to look forward to something. I mean, for example, my vacation is coming up here in June, and uh, I've made sure to have some trips planned for it, so I have something to look forward to. Uh, and uh, you need to have, you know, all. I think it's important to always have something to look forward to when times are tough and. Uh, maybe uh, things aren't working out with your girlfriend or something. You need something positive to look forward to. And sometimes uh, looking forward to something is even better than doing the, the thing itself. Mm -hmm. you know, you're looking forward to the, vaca to the vacation and you long for it. And when it happens, if you haven't planned anything, it can, kind of can get kind of boring. Uh, the chase is better than the catch, right? Yeah. In German, they have a word called for Freud, sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, enjoy the time before you actually do it. And I think it's such a good word. Uh, and you, you really need to have that. But then I can do all without all the, you know, cheesy uh, way he puts it at times, you know, all these uh, mem, what is it called? Mems, mem memos that people put on facebook you know oh, memes. Uh, big word yeah, memes. memes memes yeah memes uh and it's it's kind of silly i mean it's, uh, i have a hard time you know <laughs> rooting for those memes yeah that's so important someone a thousand time you you see it everywhere but 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 you need goals uh, always yeah I, I definitely agree that's one of the things that i um can agree with him on this you know, I do agree that you should always add to your list, not subtract from it, you know, because that makes life more exciting, I think, you know. I mean, I've been lucky that a few of my bucket list things I have been able to check off, but, you know, we try to add something new to it, you know. And uh, I even try to make sometimes, I always try to put at least one really ridiculous one to kind of strive for because then you know you're never going to get that one or if you do, you're very, very lucky. But, you know, kind of like your idea, Julian, where it's like always have your dreams come true except the one, right? So you always have something to go after, right? So I, I, I agree with Paul. You know, for, for once in this book, there's something very positive that he talks about. And I think it's important, though, that he put that kind of positive tag give people something to look forward to in, in the reading. That's not just going to be negative, you know? Yeah, and there, it's, uh, again, to be totally honest, there's a lot more positivity in this book than these few select quotes that I've cherry-picked rapidly this yeah. morning over a period of 30 minutes and a cup of tea uh, to discuss <laughs> on this episode. So, you know, there, there 
are a lot of things in there. Um, I think we'll have to do an episode about Backstage Pass, and that's create a soundtrack for the book for each chapter after everyone's read it, because that could be hilarious <laughs> to, to, ha to pick a Paul Stanley song that goes with the theme of each chapter. Let's move on. I've got a couple more uh, here that I'd like to talk about, and I think we get to the crux of the matter with this next quote about how Paul sees everything within KISS and what has actually striven a lot of his decision-making. There was also an underlying motivation for me to want the band to take off the makeup. There's really no denying that with makeup, Gene is the face of KISS. But I've always, in essence, been the voice of KISS. Well, any way... Oh, pardon me. Well, another way for me to get my due or to get more of what I thought I deserved was to take off the makeup because I was basically the same person I was with the makeup, whereas Gene relied on the makeup. In essence, uh, in a sense, we changed the face of the band. I think we get to a very um, blatant truth there that, that kind of guided um, some big decisions that started happening in 1980-81 when they were going back and forth about dropping the makeup with the Elder. I can see why Paul would want to for all of the 70s and even to this day you're more likely to see gene simmons face you know gene is and remains the face of the band whereas paul is i call him the heart and soul but the voice of the band so um do you think that that's honest and how how do you digest that that uh, little quote that seemed really honest to me uh, i think it's the first time i've heard him say something uh, like that, where, where he's recognizing that Gene actually was the face of Kiss. Uh, I mean, Gene Simmons in the 70s was like the perfect character uh, with uh, all the uh, mystery and uh, not knowing who he was and all the gimmicks he had on stage. I mean, it's hard to do these days. You see a lot of bands trying, but I haven't seen anyone that can do it the way he did it. I mean, it, I guess it's too late to be that to to bring shock rock to to the people like he did. Uh, so I think it's nice nice that he's kind of recognizing that at one point in time he wasn't the big guy in Kiss sort of. And uh, I understand that this was a big reason for him to accept playing without makeup. You know, I guess he was one of the driving forces behind it. Uh, and he became the face of Kiss for for the 80s and during the 80s and, and early 90s, big time. Uh, not only because he was a much better looker than Gene, but he actually wrote a lot of much better songs. And um, actually, when he removed those high heels, he became even a better performer on stage, I think. I mean, have a look at the animals, Animalized Live Uncensored video, for example. He's running around like crazy. He must have had uh, an awesome stamina. I mean, how could he <laughs> run around like that and play his instrument and sing at the same time? It's really... Uh, I haven't heard about his workout ethics, but he must have been doing something in order to be able to do that. Uh, and at the same time, I'm sure he looked at other bands coming, coming up where the, there was a lead singer often that had similar looks to him getting a lot of attention so i guess you know with a new wave of british heavy metal and all that he saw that you could do it actually without makeup and that you could get a lot of attention without it so but it's it's fun to hear that he he, he sa says that about gene mark yeah yeah i i agree i mean it you know and for the type of person that paul is for him to actually admit that somebody had more importance in the band than him Probably took a lot for him to admit it, I think. But, you know, I also kind of get the vibe from the quote that he finally kind of was like relieved that the attention was now focused over to him instead of Gene. And the one thing that kind of bothers me a bit about that is that this is supposed to be a band. You know, like in essence, everybody is supposed to be important in the band i mean like we said before if we didn't have these four people in the band it would not have happened the chemistry would have been totally different who knows how it would have been right so for me to kind of say that one guy is more important than the other i don't like that sort of dynamic but i understand that that it did happen because that's just how 
it was back then. You know, Gene, what, Gene's character was much more, uh, I guess, photogenic. More people wanted to take pictures of him and put him on magazine covers. More people found him maybe more interesting to talk about, you know, to or to talk to for interviews than Paul maybe back at that time. But in the 80s, Paul definitely came into his own. You know, he was much more of the, you know, better athletically shaped guy. You know, he could do those high kicks and sprint around the stage and like nobody could, you know, and that's not easy. I mean, Daniel just, just mentioned it too. He must have incredible stamina. And I remember that one of the things that we used to do when we were uh, preparing to do tours and shows, and I, and, I, and I invite people to try this so you can see how difficult this is, is to, to get our stamina up to do shows and to get our singing decent. We would go on to the gym, go on a treadmill for 20 minutes, get ourselves to a decent you know, jogging pace, and put the lyrics of our songs in front of us and attempt to sing it. If you can sing that song decently melodically, and still keep that jogging pace up, then you'll do okay on stage. Because you know how hard that is to do. You'll start hopping and puffing, missing words, and you'll start sounding like Vince Neil, you know? And th- th- you don't want that to happen, you know? You want to be able to go up on stage and de- deliver it. Sure, it's not going to be perfect like in the studio, but doing that sort of exercise where you're doing that kind of higher tension cardio and then trying to sing a song at the same time, it's not as easy as you think. Try it, and you'll see how, how hard it could be. Agreed. Yep. All right, I think that's a that's a good little reactionary um, episode for Backstage Pass. I want to end with one part of the book, which is to bring it all back to the beginning of the book and Paul's dedication. To my dad, who has saved his greatest gifts, gifts to me for last. So, you know, that, let's have a happy ending there, because uh, I know some of that stuff, some of those quotes are pretty tough, pretty rough. But um, I, I think my initial review of this book is I'm disappointed. I was looking for, like, I, I was hoping it was going to be a full color, you know, kind of glossy thing with vignettes, little stories um, about certain things with recipes and, you know, health tips. I, I thought it was really going to be uh, a little bit more than something that I think is more cathartic to Paul in his continued journey. Uh, down the conveyor belt, as he puts it, you know, he, he does say in the book that life's like a conveyor belt, and you get to a point where there are more people behind you than there are ahead of you. Um, I, I, it seems like a therapy book in some ways. That he's got more to get off his chest, or he's got stuff to get off his chest on a continuing basis. And some of those quotes kind of are, are the pointers that really point to a man who's very complex, who hasn't reached where he needs to be yet in his personal journey. And he's he's still on it. So again, I rec- I I know both of you are on the fence about it, and probably even more so after me cherry picking those quotes. But I do recommend you going out and getting it. Particularly, it, this was on sale for me, so it was certainly nowhere near its uh, twenty seven ninety nine list price. I think I got it for like eighteen bucks on Amazon. Uh, it's certainly better than. Uh, and Mark, you said you usually buy all the Kiss books. Did you buy Me Inc? Did you buy Ladies of the Night? I, I didn't buy Ladies of the Night, but I do have Me Inc. No. And I do have some I do have some of the other books that he's put out too. Some what of about these. On Power. No, that I didn't that I didn't get that. Okay. Book. But I, 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 mean, I've I think you'll be I think you'll be happier with this than On Power or Me Inc. So okay. that, that's just my my guess. All right, so let's leave that there today. Uh, both of you, if you do read it, start thinking about a soundtrack. There's seventeen uh, chapters in this book. Each one has a title. And that, that'll be fun, actually, to start thinking about uh, Paul Stanley songs. And that would be a soundtrack to this book. All right, that's it for now. Um, initial thoughts on some of the parts of Paul Stanley's backstage pass and what else is going on. Have you picked up the book yet? What do you think of those quotes? Do you want to join the rumble on the Kiss FAQ message board? Because the threads, I think, are at 12 pages and 10 pages, um, respectively, on the Peter Chris quote and the I, I wish my father was dead quote. Um, you know, what's what's your take on that stuff? What's your, st- your take on uh, kicking the bucket list and... Uh, 
Gene is the face of Kiss is the reason why we got rid of the makeup so that Paul could be the face of Kiss. Uh, <laughs> happy, happy, joy, joy. Kiss is playing in Mexico tonight, so it's going to be interesting for our European friends to see how Kiss are doing a festival stage because they do have quite a few festival appearances scheduled during the summer. Oh, yeah, breaking news from yesterday, David Garibaldi, will be painting his way across Europe with the band opening on select dates, and we're just waiting for those dates. I'm actually happy for David that that is the case, um, because I do want to see what he does in the European context and how the show goes over in those markets. So I wish him the best of luck on the road with the band during the summer. That's it for now. From Daniel, from Mark and myself, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.